Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're so thankful you could join us here. As we kind of get close to the end of this quarter, we have just two more lessons left. This is a bit of a tough topic today, tried mm -hmm. and crucified. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot of things to consider. I know we didn't get to everything last week, but we will um, attempt to work through this tough uh, and challenging mm -hmm. and sad topic today. Uh, before that, we're going to have the mission story, but just a note about um, how it goes today. Um, we're doing a YouTube premiere of the Sabbath School, then we're going to end that and start the live church. So if you're watching this live, don't forget to kind of click out back to the YouTube channel page and then click back in for the live church service. Because at the end of this Sabbath School, it's going to just end and we're going to start a new stream. So that's a technicality. Let's go to the mission story now. The island of Dominica is commonly mistaken for the Dominican Republic, but it's actually its own beautiful island nation in the middle of the Caribbean islands, separating the Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean Sea. It's full of waterfalls, tropical beaches, and hot springs. The island is also full of children who need a good education. The Ebenezer SDA Primary School has become one of the most respected schools on the island. They would like every child to receive education, but many challenges are now facing them. This school is special because I can see God's miraculous hands in the school. A school that is so crowded, it is located between two main highways, I would say. So it's noise destruction. And the school within all of these situation challenges is doing so well. It's among the top 10 on island. And I'm always amazed to see how God works with this school. The school stands right next to a large river that leads to the ocean. Whenever hurricanes or strong rains come, the river floods the school. This is only one of the challenges they face. We have also faced the challenges of having road repairs done by the government right next to us, and uh, the machines working constantly throughout the day while exam and classes are going on. We had to battle with all of that. The Ebenezer Primary School has become so popular, they have to turn away students looking to enroll. Even the 200 students they have now overcrowd the school. Before you know it, we have to shut the registration because of the number of persons that are coming in. And uh, begging for space, asking if they could bring a desk, if they could bring a bench, whatever the situation, but at the current as it is, we just do not have the space to take in any other child. The school has started construction on a new building that they hope will solve these issues. The facility will accommodate 300 students, as well as provide new resources. We're looking at 10 classrooms in terms of space. We're looking at having a, a, um, a computer lab, a, a science lab, also the yard space they have in terms of for the students to be able to, to play and enjoy themselves also will be larger than we presently have. The Ebenezer SDA Primary School already has a good reputation in the community. They're now awaiting funds to complete the construction of their new school building. Part of your 13th Sabbath offering will go to help finish the construction of the new Ebenezer SDA Primary School building and inspire the next generation of students. I assure you, your contribution will not be lost. You will look back. It may be, who knows, these same children whom we are educating will serve you and your generations in the years to come. And these children who you are contributing to We'll end up being, who knows, the next general conference president. Who knows, the next education director. Please pray for the education work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world and the growth in Dominica. Thank you for your support of projects like this. And welcome back to our Tridelphia Seventh-day Adventist Church Bible Study 
online group. Um, you can go ahead and type in the comments where you're from. We really appreciate having you here. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to chat them in the comments. You can always email pastor at tridelphiachurch.org mm. and also ask questions there. If you're finding this three years after it was originally broadcast, that might be a good way to uh, you know, reach out to us, although you can always leave a comment on the YouTube video when this is not live. All right, tried and crucified, tough topic. I'm gonna read the um, memory text for this week and then you can open with prayer. So it's, memory text comes from Mark 15, verse 34. It says, and in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama shlabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you open us? Yes, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to open your word. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us also to um, once again have this beautiful picture of sacrificial love mm. shown by Jesus and also shown by you. And Father, may we learn from this example how to do your will regardless of how we feel, regardless of what is going on in our life, regardless if everything around us is falling apart, to keep trusting you no matter what. We thank you, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, as you remember last week, we talked about the Last Supper, mm -hmm. and even prior to that, there was the aspect of um, Mary Magdalene coming and breaking that gorgeous multiple figure um, super expensive bottle of custom perfume yes and getting that judgment thrown on her then the there's a riff in the disciples and one of them leaves to go start the process of betrayal mm -hmm. then we have the process of betrayal and we didn't quite get to this aspect you know we got to the point in the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is just crying out Agonizing. and pleading mm -hmm take this cup from me. Mm -hmm. But what? Not my will be done, but yours. Which is something that I struggle with now. Mm -hmm. You know, in our life, we want to do this, or we see the vision for that, and right. we want to go with that. But Jesus knew what that plan was. Mm -hmm. And at the end, he didn't buckle, but mm -hmm. he open that door saying, you know, I really don't want to take this on, but if I must, I, I will. And what happened after that? After a big that, crowd comes in. A big crowd comes in, and Judas is leading that crowd, and he comes to Jesus, and he kisses him. Hmm. And Jesus basically asks Judas, are you betraying me with a kiss? That was his sign. He had said, whoever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him and lead him away. Mm -hmm. And that's what basically brought an end to what seemed to be Jesus' ministry among his disciples and among the people. I don't think Judas was expecting that to happen. Mm. I think he was expecting, you know, maybe to speed up the process of God's kingdom or Correct. something. He, he thought Jesus would definitely do something to get out of this one. Well, like and wasn't there it. that like amazing thing where there's a kind of a flash and then all the soldiers and stuff fall That's down true. for a second. So like maybe he caught on, but then it just kind of just kept going. He kept going. And uh, the interesting thing is like Peter, of course, is taken over and trying to uh, protect Jesus and then he also gets put in his place. And at that point, they all scatter. They all scatter. They're too scared to be close to Jesus. Even though we do have a few disciples that go up to the Sanhedrin, where Jesus is now being interrogated, and basically he has a group of religious leaders trying to find fault in him. And it's, it's interesting because they're kind of just asking lots of questions mm -hmm. and they're bringing false witnesses to say things and Jesus really doesn't say anything. He doesn't. 
And so they are really upset. In fact, one of them strikes him because he's so upset that Jesus did not answer him back. Yeah. And it says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, finally? Um, in 14, verse uh, 61. And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And, you know, at that point, he's just like, well, what further witness do we have? That's says enough blasphemy, mm -hmm. you know. So at this point, um, it's like the camera turns to this other scene, and mm -hmm. Peter is kind of in the subtle crowd off to the side mm -hmm. in the courtyard, just warming himself. I guess it was kind of a cool evening. But... Uh, People start pointing out, hey, weren't you... Among them? Aren't you guys together? Mm -hmm. And of course he's like, no. And then somebody else is like, hey, disciple of Jesus, right? And then he, he like, anyway, three times in and that rooster crows and, um, yeah. And he leaves that place weeping. He's sad. It's quite a dramatic end to what he was thinking. And he so had everything in his mind put together mm -hmm. and like just hours before he had been saying, oh, we'll stick with you to the end. And then here he is like, I, I don't know who that guy is. And it's so interesting here, Peter, that you have um, something that happens to most of us. We have this reaction to to a crisis or a problem or a difficulty or conflict. Mm -hmm. And the first reaction that Peter had when he saw the crowd coming to take Jesus, he took out his sword and whoosh, he was ready to fight. Yeah. Yes. And even murder. Yeah. And the next thing that they do basically is flee. So that's their other option when a crisis, run. Yeah. And then in this situation, Peter denies Jesus. It's the five stages of self-preservation or five something like that. Five stages of self-preservation. What's interesting, though, is that he recognizes it's not fighting or flying or fleeing. Not flying, but fleeing. But it's the only way that he can reconcile with Jesus and he can make things right with Jesus is through repentance. Mm. And he shows that just by weeping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it was like he was at his lowest. Yes. Um, but praise the Lord, he found grace. Yeah. And he was able to be one of the most powerful preachers of the gospel. But we're not time. there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's still in his despair right now. Yes, he is. So what happens, uh, let's start here in Mark 15. Um, and we'll just kind of read from the beginning. Okay. Immediately, in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Okay, before we continue, why Pilate? Good question. So Pontius Pilate was a governor in Judea, representing the Roman government. So... It but I thought we're at odds with Rome because correct. the Jewish nation isn't working. But then this seems like some type of co cohesive something, or, or is it just them trying to get something done? So exactly. So, so basically, Jews could, yes, basically call someone against their laws, religious laws, like they were saying Jesus was blaspheming against God. But they couldn't kill him because of blaspheming against God. That was not something that... It wasn't a Roman offense. It wasn't a Roman offense. So now they have to take him to Pontius Pilate and have him uh, present a case that seems to be against their laws and yeah. might even be considered treason. Yeah. And since there had been all these other uprisings... Correct. They were hoping they could filter it into that category Correct. and get him nabbed for something like... Uh, uprising against Caesar or something like that. Something like that. 
But, uh, okay, going on verse 2. And Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? Hmm. See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude crying aloud began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. So uh, there's, there's different accounts on how Pilate answered this. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's the John 18 version where, you know, he's asking, are you, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you concerning me so there's mm -hmm. there's slightly different versions of all it was said um, but an aspect that mark may not cover is the one that john covers because john was following him along this whole time he was and so mark might cover the the top of what was said but john is going into depth and the thing I always think of is this from uh, verse 36, where Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Hmm. So that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Amen. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am king. For this cause I was born, for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Hmm. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. So it's kind of like the more detailed aspect of, of what's going on here in, in Mark. But... There's this tension because the religious leaders of the Jewish nation are stirring up the people mm -hmm. one way. Pilate is kind of agnostic toward this whole situation. He's just like, eh. I mean, he's kind of listening and asking questions, which is a great way of, uh, and I guess he had been with them already for a few years, so he kind of had his frustrations with them and uh, there's different perspectives on the Roman judicial system versus the Jewish judicial mm -hmm. system and it, the way he's answering them is just kind of like I don't really care let's get this day on with and just kind of try and get through this Passover weekend uh, mm -hmm. without too much of a conflict mm -hmm. here and I guess he was just kind of mildly interested just to make sure this wasn't an uprising. But as you can see from these texts, he's like, this guy isn't something to be too concerned with. And, and what's interesting with um, John's passage is that Jesus basically is telling him, I'm not here to take your place, your position, or anyone else's position. My kingdom is not of this world. Mm -hmm. So kind of easing him into, hey, I'm not looking for power, I'm not looking for dominion, I'm not looking to rebel against you or anyone else. And yet, he was under a lot of pressure from the crowd, who is demanding for Jesus' life. 
Not just for him to go to jail, not just for him to be, but for him to be killed. And in a very cruel way. Yeah, so once he lets him go to the um, soldiers, um, they go to the pr Praetorium, and they basically call everyone together, and mm. they clothed him with purple. They twisted this crown of thorns and put it on his head, began to salute him, hail King of the Jews. So this ends up just being a fun, uh, mm. torturous experience. Uh, and you can kind of see how the Roman soldiers could just be cruel. Like, oh, we just got somebody, okay, the Jews don't like him, Pilate doesn't care, let's just have a party out of this one. They get mm. everyone together, and it's just like this, um, mocking situation for whatever reason I guess they thought it was hilarious mm. and um, these things were just there to fulfill prophecy all along the all way along even the, way. the the Roman soldiers who had just got assigned to this area maybe they would rather be closer to Rome or mm. some of these other more interesting parts of the Roman Empire maybe they wanted to be in Pompeii or something more exciting but they're assigned to this thing they're gonna have a good time while they're there but all these little micro things the the crown of thorns the reeds the um, purple garment purple garment all of these things are just like pointing micro fulfillments of prophecy mm -hmm. and just actually really added to the whole experience and even if it was a negative thing, it was kind of like that positive thing, showing that, yes, this is the king, and yes, he is being tortured and put to death, and that's for us. Amen. And I think that is amazing. The author of this lesson talk, talks about irony yeah. and, and how Jesus, even though he's being mocked, the soldiers are truly revealing that he is the king. Yeah by saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Yeah. By placing this, this placard above the cross, above his head, saying, this is the King of the Jews. And so God finds ways, instruments, even at times where we think, hey, they're mocking, they're doing something, to get the message out there yeah. that Jesus is truly who he claims to be. So after that whole um, awful mm -hmm. um, mocking and scourging and everything, which you can think about the pain, not only physical, but the psychological and emotional pain at mm -hmm. this point. And through all of this, Jesus is looking at the bigger picture as well. He is. So you have the sins of the world weighing down on him. So, of course, they yank off the purple garment after that, put his clothes back on, and, and they just um, make him take this cross towards mm -hmm. where he's going to be crucified. It's, it's, it's an incredible, incredible detailed scene of what Jesus is having to go through to bring reconciliation, not only between God and his creation, but also reconciliation among the entire universe. God is open, willing to send Jesus, someone equal to himself, to suffer. Yeah. And the question I have, Peter, is to what extent are we willing to sacrifice? Mm -hmm. To have reconciliation with someone else. Yeah. And that's a tough question for mm -hmm. us, and it's a tough question that we can mm -hmm. pose to our YouTube audience mm -hmm. as well. You know, what do you think? Feel free to um, comment on that. Uh, there's a quote from the Desire of Ages that said, Satan led the cruel mob hmm. in its abuse of the Savior. Hmm. It was his purpose to provoke him to retaliation if possible, or to drive him to perform a miracle to release himself and thus break up the plan of salvation. So even in this moment, like 
he, he was is using hard. all the people who are not committed mm -hmm. to God mm -hmm. to really attack the Savior. They're striking him, they're spitting on him, yeah. they're mocking him. So it's not just like physical torture here, but it's also psychological, mental, emotional torture. So on their way up um, to the spot of crucifixion, there's this individual, Simon the Cyrenian. And they kind of just, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know where Alexander and Rufus come in later, but um, I guess that was known among mm -hmm. the disciples. Mm -hmm. um, but apparently he was in the crowd there and uh, he was coming out of his country and passing by. Was he coming for the Passover? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But he was in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at, at the, the right, right time. time. Yeah. And um, uh, at this point, I think Jesus is in so much pain I'm sure, you know, after, you know, not much food since maybe the Last Supper, he's hungry and faint and the whole nine yards. And they ha they're like, hey, you, you, you carry this cross. And mm -hmm. so it's an interesting thing because we don't really know how that affected the individual after that. Mm -hmm. well, what I, I can just say is once again, um, God will call individuals at specific times. And even in this case where he's basically a foreigner, yeah. he's a Cyrenian, it tells us there, Simon, which is a Jewish name, Simon, a Cyrenian, so he's outside of Israel. He's there for the feasts of Passover. Yeah. Cyrenia seems to be a city or place close to Libya. Okay. So northern Africa. So he's traveled a distance, and now he's asked to carry a cross. Which is interesting because Jesus told his disciples fairly recently before this that each one should take up his cross and follow mm. him. And... This isn't an offer, this is a compelling. Mm -hmm. And it's a foreigner. So I feel like this also plays into the whole story of, you know, that reaching out and sharing that with people outside the Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. This is where the everything starts to crack and crumble. That's right. Um, no longer is the Jewish nation God's only people, but anyone in the world mm -hmm. um, who believes who believes can be part of that and people. carries Jesus' cross mm -hmm. and puts away their self. They can have this opportunity of salvation. So it's kind of like it's a short verse, but it, there's so much in it that we can draw as a meaning beyond hey, sir, carry this cross now. Mm -hmm. so, so would this mean that as Christians we are all called to suffer? And we shouldn't see necessarily suffering as something negative? I, and I also see it as the aspect of when we're reaching out to others and telling them the good news. Mm. Um to let them know it's not all flowers and it's important. sunshine. That's important. Mm -hmm. But everyone has to make a sacrifice at some point and mm -hmm. carry a cross. And for some that means sacrificing your life. And for others that might be something very close to us that we'll have to give up or we'll have to suffer for. And this is where um, we're invited to Trust God even when things don't seem to go our way. Mm -hmm. So it says, and they brought him to the place Golgotha, mm -hmm. which is translated place of the skull. Have yeah. you been there? I've been there. So there are different places where they call it Golgotha. Okay. And so, so it's just no specific one place where they 
think you know this is where he was crucified. But there's it, estimated locations. There's estimated locations. It was outside of the city that we do know, because they did not crucify anybody within the city walls. Um, but how far outside those walls, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, verse 23. Verse 23 says, Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them, to determine what every man should take. So here we are again, back to the Roman soldiers mm -hmm. and those crucifying him. Um, we're just gonna throw some dice here and gamble this out. Who's, whose is it? This guy's dead, effectively. Um, and just this secular act plays again into a prophecy. A uh, small prophecy of the yeah. Old Testament. Psalm 22. That they uh, cast lots mm -hmm. for my garment. So, again, as godless and ungod fearing as mm -hmm. these randomly assigned Roman Soldier. soldiers were, everything just played into God's overall picture mm -hmm. perfectly. And I wonder if. Some of that was a comfort to Jesus. Amen, amen. Because, yes, yes he's in pain, mm -hmm. and they're offering him this, this wine myrrh mixture, probably to help with pain and stuff. But um, he, like, out of the corner of his eye, sees these guys throwing some dice, and he just can remember back mm -hmm. to the Psalms. And this is where, again, Peter, this gives me comfort as well when I look at this, because regardless of what other people are doing, regardless of how I am feeling at the moment, I can trust that God has a plan hmm. and He will bring it through. And even if I don't see it, Jesus didn't see it at the moment, in fact, he cries out to God, saying, my God, my God. That's what we'll see later. Um, he was in God's hand at that moment, even though he couldn't see it. And I want to think that is our experience also when we are going through a difficult time and we feel like abandoned. We feel like no one can help. God is saying, I have you in my hands. And even though people aren't committed to God, he still uses them. He still does. To fulfill his That's prophecies. Right. That's right. Um, so here they go. Um, now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above. Mm -hmm. The king of the Jews. Mm -hmm. and I believe that was in multiple languages. It was, correct. Because, I mean, it's a holiday weekend, a uh, special... Uh, feast weekend, mm -hmm. and there's people from all over uh, the world at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, that is also uh, something that caused a bit of controversy. You don't see it here in Mark, but um, they were like, hey, can you take that down? And Pilate's like, at this point, he was just fed up with them. And he's like, I've done what I've done, mm -hmm. so leave it. Verse 27. With him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So here's another, another so prophecy, you could just see yes. how all these prophecies are being fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Now this is the first one that it actually is pointing back to. There's been a number of these that are subtle and pointing back to various parts of the scripture, but this is the one that kind of calls out um, as one of the important aspects from when, when you see that, the language is exactly the same as um, in Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. So. Um, those reading these right. words can look back to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure at what point 
people were starting to read this letter of Mark, but um, as they are understanding the life of Christ, they could look back to the Old Testament prophecies of the prophets and see uh, some of those aspects. And this was one of the more important ones. The casting lots one may have not been like uh, a super important aspect of it. It's not something to highlight, but this one is one of those because we're transgressors mm -hmm. and it really puts Jesus on our level does, and even does. lower because mm -hmm. these aren't just the day-to-day -day transgressors, these are the bad guys. Criminals. These are the criminals who have ended up on death row effectively mm -hmm. and at least in this day and age you have to be pretty pretty bad and do some very seriously bad things to end up on death row. Mm -hmm. And so again, I think we, we, we see um, Jesus um, being mocked at. What's interesting also is that the, these religious leaders remember some of Jesus' own words. And verse 29 tells us, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who destroy the temple and build it, it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. So they remembered those, those words of Jesus, that prophecy that his body, he was talking about his body, would be destroyed. And on three days after, it would be restored again. And I don't know if that was... Jesus had a lot on his mind, and I don't know if that was an encouragement or a discouragement mm -hmm. to him. Because them reminding him of this is just something temporary, not to fear. But at some point, mm -hmm. he had such a disconnect from the Father mm -hmm. that he couldn't see past that. He so even if this was encouraging for a moment, within a hour or two, it was, it was not he there. It was not there anymore. And of course, yeah, he, them saying he saved others, himself he cannot save. Which, on the surface, is a valid argument. Mm -hmm. Because how does he raise up Lazarus? Or you think of the widow who lost her son. They're walking out of the city with the casket and raises him back to life. Or um, these people that were blind, these people that were mute. All these people being healed or resurrected. And then here's Jesus on the cross. And what's so interesting, uh, the author of the lesson points out, one, they recognize him as Savior, because they do recognize he's done this yeah. in the past. What they don't recognize is what we recognize today, is that Jesus was doing this to save you and me. Yeah. He was doing this for us, to save the world from our sins and from our transgressions and to give us the hope of a new life and a new future and an and, and, and everlasting life. And all the way from the Old Testament, this had been traced and painted right. and memorialized in the concept of a guy sins or his family sins. So he takes that special perfect lamb mm -hmm. from his um, herd of sheep and takes it to the temple it gets killed and sacrificed, and the representations of the blood being sprinkled here on the mercy seat and different things like that, and then the, the body uh, burned and, and all mm -hmm. these different things. Everything was pointing to this point, and here we are, you know, hundreds of years mm -hmm. of this, and now we're in that moment. And we're there. We have all these. The type meets the anti-type. Yeah, but it's in the most undignified way, it mm -hmm. seems. So it was, uh, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here we are at that point mm -hmm. where he is closed out 
from heaven, it seems. Mm -hmm. And this is the pain of those who go through the second death. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's no hope. Um, if you want to know more about first death versus second death, the various resurrections, the uh, the resurrection before the millennium, the re resurrection after the millennium, feel free to reach out to the pastor. Mm -hmm. But this is like one of those things where at some point when everything is said and done and in the future when all the saints have gone to heaven, all the righteous are resurrected to heaven, you have the wicked. You have Satan, you have his angels, mm -hmm. and they're all consumed. Consumed till the memory of them is no more. That, that is the second death that you do not want to be a part of. And this is the part where God forsakes. Um, the righteous have that opportunity, the righteous have that glory, that mm -hmm. beauty to be able to be with Jesus and God in heaven. But the wicked, the wicked are shut out. Mm -hmm. And this is where Jesus is at, at this point. Mm -hmm. We find, we find um, something similar to what Mark tells us in the beginning of his gospel where Jesus is presented as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world at his baptism. Yeah. And they hear a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, you know? And it's interesting how now the gospel is finishing with these words from Jesus, my God, my God, where are you basically? Yeah. Why, why? And, um, that's a hard question to answer many times, especially when we're going through a difficult time, we're suffering. We want to ask that question, why? Why me? Or why a friend? Or why is this happening in our world, God? And yet, um, God is there. He is there. He's present. He has not forsaken us. Even though everything around us seems doom and gloom, He is there. And what He asks of you and me is what He asked of His own Son, Jesus, trust me. Trust me, we'll, we'll get through this together. Uh, and of course they are hearing, um, oh look, he's calling for Elijah, you uh -huh, know? Yeah. It, it just kind of like, the, the way he cried must have gotten to somebody's heart because somebody goes and fills a sponge with sour mm, wine, yes. put it on a reed, offered him to drink, saying. Correct, it eases uh, pain. You know, and there's people also saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. Hmm. So that's also a very prove God yourself type mm -hmm. boldness mm -hmm. and rudeness as well. So there's so many things going on here. And at this point, Jesus cries out with a loud voice and breathes his last. Hmm. There must have been amazing silence in the whole universe, like, it's over, it's done, and it's, it's inter finished. It's interesting because there's a loud voice in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Jesus coming back, crying with a loud voice. Of an archangel. Awake, awake, mm -hmm. you know. But here you have him crying with it. So in spite of everything, in spite of the fact he is basically almost dead, here's this last loud cry with this loud voice. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's amazing because right after here, uh -huh. it says the veil of the temple was torn in two from top mm -hmm. to bottom. So it, somewhere in there as well, there's this earthquake happening as well. So. You know, maybe in a movie or with sound effects and whatever, you can turn somebody's voice into like this roaring sound, but you can't shake the earth like this. Mm -hmm. And so he cries with this loud voice, there's this earthquake, there's lightnings, there's thunderings, 
and the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And that verse is just, it looks like it's just casually dropped in there because it's like, what, we're not even, that we're outside the city. Why is this such an important verse? This is so important because, um, for one, the temple was the most important place for Jews and it was the place of worship. And this most holy place was the place that basically represented God's presence with his people. Mm. God dwelt among his people. God was part of their life. He wasn't this distant God, this God who didn't care, this God who maybe didn't even know human beings were suffering so much or struggling so much because he was busy with other things. But he was a present God, a God who, who, who was there. And that s curtain is torn down, basically representing that there is no more separation between us and God. Mm. We have access, direct access to his throne of grace in our moment of need. And it's an invitation through Jesus through his great sacrifice on the cross for us to come boldly before God. Before there was this veil separating us from God. And we were basically, um, yeah, apart from him, away from him. But Jesus made it possible for you, for me, for all of us to be reconciled mm. and be one with God again. Uh, there's a quote that says, The rending of the veil of the temple showed that Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. Amen. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary yeah, to the heavenly, where Jesus had entered by his own blood to shed upon his disciples the benefits of his atonement. But the Jews were left in total darkness. Mm -hmm. They lost all the light which they might have had upon the plan of salvation and still trusted in their useless sacrifices and offerings. The heavenly sanctuary had taken the place of the earthly, yet they had no knowledge of the change. Therefore, they could not be benefited by the mediation of Christ in the holy place. And one more quote that kind mm -hmm. of summarizes this full experience on the cross mm -hmm. comes from the book, The Story of Red Redemption. It says, every pang endured by the Son of God upon the cross, the blood drops that flowed from his head, his hands and feet, the convulsions of agony which racked his frame and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face from him, speak to man saying, it is for love of thee that the Son of God consents to have these heinous crimes laid upon him. For thee he spoils the domain of death and opens the gates of paradise and immortal life. He who stilled the angry waves by his word and walked the foam-capped billows, who made devils tremble and disease flee from his touch, who raised the dead to life and opened the eyes of the blind, offers himself upon the cross as a last sacrifice for man. He, the sin-bearer, endures judicial punishment for iniquity and becomes sin itself for man. Hmm. Powerful. What Jesus was willing to do to save us all. And you have the opportunity to accept mm -hmm. the free gift of salvation. Mm -hmm. It's not some trite little thing. Mm -hmm. It was well planned mm -hmm. from the planned. beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's one of these topics that we We'll have the opportunity of studying through eternity once we get to heaven. We can study the plan of salvation now and we can understand it like uh, is said in 1 Corinthians, now we see through a, a glass dimly, but eventually we'll have face to face and we'll be able to fully understand how this whole substitution process works. But right now we just invite you to accept that gift of salvation Amen. because it's free. Mm -hmm and it's accessible to us, all you need to do is accept and believe. Amen.
Pastor, could you close us? I'll be glad to. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the amazing gift of salvation that you've given us through Jesus. We thank you for his humility and his love and his meekness to carry our burdens on that cross, to carry our sins, our transgressions. <clears throat> and Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that we find in that great sacrifice. And so today, we open our heart to you. We invite your Holy Spirit to come in and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins to you. And we thank you for the forgiveness we have found and for the peace that you give us, not only to enjoy, but also to share with those around us. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are watching. We pray for all those who today um, are joining us. We ask your blessing upon them. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks again so much for joining us. Um, we encourage you to click in next week, check in with us, subscribe, like, share. And just a note about today, mm -hmm. if you're watching this live, this ends right now. And you'll have to go to the YouTube page and find this stream. We did it in two parts today, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but next week, it should be that full, consistent uh, uh, stream that goes straight from Sabbath school to church. Anyway, take care. Happy Sabbath. See you next week. Greetings, friends. Today, as we continue our journey through the great controversy, we will be reviewing one of the most serious chapters in the book, titled, The Final Warning. Focusing on the prophecies found in Revelation, specifically chapters 14 and 18, we will be considering God's final warning that will be given to the world just before Jesus returns. The Bible assures us that God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is what this final warning is all about. In Revelation 14, 6 through 12, we have become acquainted with the three angels' uh, messages and their very important proclamations, including the second angel, which says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. When we turn to Revelation 18, we find a fourth angel that amplifies this important message. John the Revelator describes it like this, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Following this powerful message, John hears another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities." Although their messages are very similar, the contrast between the second angel of Revelation 14 and this fourth angel of Revelation 18 is striking. While both angels proclaim that Babylon is fallen, the angel in Revelation 14 simply speaks his message, while the fourth angel of Revelation 18 cries mightily with a loud voice. This angel comes down from heaven with great authority, and the earth is illuminated with his glory. Included in this fourth angel's message is a heavenly plea for God's people to come out of Babylon. Now, as we have seen earlier, Babylon means confusion and represents a confused and fallen system of worship which tramples on the law of God. Commenting on this passage in Revelation 18, the inspired author of the book, The Great Controversy, writes, 
This scripture points forward to a time when the announcement of the fall of Babylon as made by the second angel of Revelation 14 is to be repeated with the additional mention of the corruptions which have been entering the various organizations that constitute Babylon since that message was first given in the summer of 1844. You might remember in an earlier chapter of the Great Controversy, we learned about the Great Advent Awakening, when based on the prophecies of Daniel, William Miller and many others looked for the second coming of Christ in 1844. Because of their belief in the soon coming of Christ, many were forced to leave their churches, which rejected the Advent message. While Miller had mistakenly identified the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, as Christ's second coming to cleanse the earth, his calculation of the 2,300-day prophecy, or 2,300-year prophecy, because one day in prophecy represents one year, his calculation was right. The second angel's message of Revelation 14 was correctly proclaimed, and those who accepted Bible prophecy were willing to leave their churches rather than to give up Bible truth. We read in the Great Controversy that in Revelation 18, a terrible condition of the religious world is here described. With every rejection of truth, the minds of the people will become darker and their hearts more stubborn until they are entrenched as infidels. Despite these terrible conditions, however, God still has true-hearted people in Babylon. Those religious institutions that claim to follow Christ but reject His word, that's what Babylon is, including the Sabbath commandment found in Exodus 20, 8 through 11. These precious people need to be warned of the coming judgments that will soon fall upon this apostate system. So God sends a strong message to come out of Babylon before it's too late. These announcements, we're told, uniting with the third angel's message, constitute the final warning to be given to the inhabitants of the earth. The third angel's message, you might remember, is found in Revelation 14, 9 through 12. It warns that those who worship the beast and his image and receive his mark will experience the wrath of God and will suffer terrible consequences. Following this very strong warning, the passage then describes those who have heeded the third angel's message and have not received the mark of the beast. Verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. My dear friends, the world is on the edge of the last great battle between good and evil. Soon, the final warning will be given. In our next video, we will look more deeply at how this will take place and how the prophetic message of Revelation 18 will be fulfilled. Until then, I once again encourage you to download your free copy of The Great Controversy, where you can learn more about the amazing events soon to take place here on this earth. The book is available for free, downloaded at thegreatcontroversyproject.org. Let's pray together just now. Father in heaven, thank you for giving to us the marvelously powerful message of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, the three angels' messages proclaiming your creative power, proclaiming that people are to stay away from the confusion of Babylon, that people are to follow your commandments and worship on the seventh-day Sabbath as opposed to 
the false worship on Sunday and that we then by staying close to you will be sealed by you as we keep the fourth commandment and keep the Sabbath day holy. And those who will not adhere to your word and will worship on a false day, the first day of the week, they will receive the mark of the beast. Lord, we ask that you will keep us close to you. We ask that you will help us as we proclaim the fourth angel of Revelation 18, helping people to come out of Babylon and confusion and come to the true worship of God. Guide us, each one, as we look to you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.